Well, that was a, that was a very kind introduction. Thank you. I mean, uh, I'm sort of flabbergasted by that introduction. Chris will be writing the uh, application for sainthood upon my death, I hope. <laughs> but it was, it was very sweet. Um, uh, I'd like to thank uh, everyone who brought, the people who brought me here at Lannan Foundation. I'm very glad to be here and to be with you. Thank you for coming out tonight. I hope when you leave tonight, you'll have a sense of my work and maybe a sense of how comics can be used as journalism. I, I kind of want to convince you of that. I mean, comics, you had them as a kid, and perhaps you've heard of graphic novels, and you may have read some. But this is, you know, this presentation is comics as journalism, and I'd, I'd like you to think of it as a medium that can also do journalism. So without further ado, I'll just start here. OK, you probably all know this particular image. It was taken by a photographer named Eddie Adams, and he got the Pulitzer Prize for this image. It shows the chief of national police of the uh, Republic of Vietnam executing a Viet Cong suspect on the streets of Saigon during the Tet Offensive in 1968. This is during the Vietnam War. And you probably also know that this is one of those photographs that galvanized the American public against the war. Um, it just has this power to shock even to this day. Now, when, when you look at this picture, it also has a certain aesthetic value, uh, if you don't mind me saying this. Uh, and, and if you forgive the pun, it's, it's kind of the perfect shot. I mean, literally, it's at the, the, the instant of the Viet Cong suspect's death. And you can see that the image goes, if you take from the head of the general down his shoulder, across his arm to the gun, and then straight to the head of the Viet Cong suspect, you have this sort of curve that leads into it. And I think uh, a photographer can wait probably his whole professional career for a picture like this. And a good photojournalist, through a combination of skill, the skill to basically insert yourself into a situation like this, and luck, literally to snap the image at the right time, it, it, it helped give Eddie Adams this, this particular image that we all know. Now, this is another image. Uh, a painting. It's by Goya. It's in the Prado Museum, and it's called The Third of May. And what it shows is Spanish civilians uh, being executed by French soldiers. And the day before, the second of May, subject of another of, of his paintings, the Spaniards uh, rose up, or some group of Spaniards rose up in Madrid, and the insurrection was put down, and the next day they took out unarmed men, uh, close to 200 and shot them down. And so I thought I'd begin, uh, since Joe and I have both worked overseas, and you've even done comics, Christmas with Karadich, about the press. Um, and because the way that you chose to report these stories is so unique and at variance with many of the sort of traditional methods of covering a conflict, how it was for you when you first bumped up against the International Press Corps, what you began to observe, what bothered you about it, you know, what your observations were, and what sort of set you on a different path? Well, in a way, um, the path was sort of made for me because I never went to these places, at the beginning anyway, with anything about my own money. So when you're there on your own dime, you can't really hang out with the press corps. So really, for the first two months I was in Bosnia, I avoided them completely. Partly also, I have to admit, I was worried what they would think. You know, a cartoonist in Bosnia, what the hell are you doing here? Um, what, what's good about that is it forced me to sort of uh, rent a room uh, from an older woman and stay with her. And from her, I got a different sense. I mean, you get a different sense when you're living in a place like that as opposed to in a hotel. And when you're not hanging out with journalists, you still want a social life. And having little money, I was doing what Bosnian people were doing. That's how I sort of found Club Obala. And they welcomed me there. And the interesting thing is, uh, as you know, a lot of people in Sarajevo were very cynical about the, the press. And uh, when I got there, they said, oh, you're OK. You're a cartoonist. To them, that was sort of a, a cultural cachet, 
which I was able to sort of use. Now, the press themselves, when I finally did meet them, I have to say, mostly they were very gracious to me. I felt that if you could, if you could talk in that sort of rarefied air about what was going on, you knew what was going on, you were accepted. I did see, you know, I hang out with a lot of radio journalists, and I, what I did see is sort of this mixture of concern for the place coupled with how much money they were going to be making. And I, took, I, I paid a lot of attention to uh, uh, how much money each, they, they, would, they would say, well, if you, if you tell, uh, one, one journalist would tell another, you know, you just gave that story, and that's five stories. You could have broken that up into five stories and made five times the amount of money. There was this constant talking about money. Uh, I guess it, you know, maybe out of necessity, but uh, that was going on at the time, too. That's the bifurcation, though, between freelance reporters and staff correspondents, which wasn't true if you were there for the Washington Post or the New York Times. Uh, but I think you captured that. And there was a kind of, mercen there's a kind of mercenary quality to it. I mean, I... I